I'd like to introduce Gregory Stein. Uh, Gregory is the president and CEO of Cortana Pharmaceuticals uh, in Austin. His extensive career has spanned everything from clinician to hospital administrator to life science executive, and he has founded multiple drug development companies. Great. You like that? Yeah. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's really an honor to be here, uh, and I am bringing a little different perspective than uh, some of the other speakers. Um, in part, I could just say ditto, and I'm done, and it's time to move on to questions. Um, so some of what I'm going to say will be uh, a, a bit redundant, but I'm also going to be bringing in a much, uh, hopefully a different perspective than, uh, than the previous speakers. So a little bit of, on my background. Uh, as Mary said, I'm a clinician by training. I uh, was originally board certified in emergency medicine, trained in Chicago. I, was assistant medical director of a large ER on the west side of Chicago, treated thousands of patients, uh, helped run the ER, was a, a hospital administrator, as I said. But I came to the conclusion after several years that cost containment is not where my heart was. I was an entrepreneur and wanted to innovate. There wasn't a lot of innovation in emergency medicine. It's primary care. And although the shows that you see on TV make it seem really dramatic and exciting, uh, most of the time, it's runny noses, sore throats, broken bones, and whatnot. And I missed med school, and I missed uh, residency and all the excitement that that brought. So I went back to school, and I got an MBA in San Diego and got plugged into the local life science community and started consulting and building companies. And from that experience over the last, gosh, uh, 14, 15 years now, um, hopefully I can impart a little bit of my wisdom and share with you uh, the, many of the mistakes that I made so that uh, hopefully your timeline isn't 15 years and maybe it's only 10 or something of that nature. So first of all, we may not even need this conference because scientists have discovered a cure for cancer and that they're going to have it by next year. So a lot of this is probably not needed, but we're going <laughs> to... No, and the, the reason I bring this up is because we're all technologists by training, right? And we think we've, we've found that breakthrough discovery, and, and that's it. We've got a billion dollars, back up the truck, give me, you know, write me a big check, and we're done. You know, we're done. We've discovered the cure for cancer. Well, unfortunately, you know, that's not really, really the case. Now, the next slides here are contextually, I, I just wanted to provide some background. This has been covered by some of the other speakers. And um, so I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but what I have, have learned in this process is that this is a truly an iterative process. It is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, and it certainly takes, takes a lot, a lot of uh, money as well. Um, and we know that qualitatively, th you know, thousands and thousands of compounds ultimately lead to a single asset. Uh, actually making it into uh, the clinic. Now, this is, some, this is a little bit dated. This is from 2010, but this gives a little more quantitative perspective on where the risk is, what the cost is, and how, from a business perspective, we can kind of start thinking about this. So, you know, at the top here, we have our, our drug development pathway. This is probability of technical success. This is one data set, but, and it's a little different than the numbers that uh, Michelle quoted, but at the end of the day, it all kind of turns out to be the same. But if, if you multiply out these pro uh, probabilities, there's about a 35% chance of success from ideas that start, heat, start from the target to hit to even get to the clinic, and then you've got maybe a 12% chance of success here, so that at the end of the day, if you multiply those out, it's about 4%, right? So that what this is showing is that you have to have 25 projects at the start if you, from a probabilistic perspective, want to get to one success, right? But we know how probabilities work, right? You can have runs and runs, so you could have, with that kind of success rate, you could have hundreds of failures before you ultimately get to a success. And that's why we're only seeing a handful of winners every year making it to, uh, through an FDA approval. Now, what's interesting here also is what is that cost, right? So we, the, the, here's the sort of the direct cost. So WIP is work in progress. And if we look at the cost per each 
stage, and this is dated uh, number, so you can add, you know, multiply this by one and a half to two, probably, to, to get a more uh, current number on what that costs. But if you're going to get one successful drug, you know, the, the cost for 24, you know, 24 projects, it adds up a lot, and when you figure in the cost of capital, and that is, you know, what else could you be doing with that money elsewhere, and and how does that impact the, uh, the, the, the cost of the capital, that the, the numbers add up tremendously. And the, the total number in this analysis was close to 1.8 billion. We've seen uh, 2.6 out of the Tufts data. Bottom line is, any one project, the absolute cost may not be as high as one might think, but when you figure in all this opportunity cost, it, it ends up being uh, quite expensive. And so, and that's, that's just all sort of preamble and background and, and has been well, uh, well stated by others as well. But what I really want to talk about is thinking about what, you know, what makes a good opportunity and how can we assess that in a way so that we increase our probability of success early on and that we don't waste our time on things that aren't going to be, in the end, worthwhile. So in, in certainly in cancer, uh, the question's not too hard, right? You want that high on medical need, it solves uh, a critical problem, but there has to be a robust market. There's lots of orphan indications out there with 150, 300 patients. Really huge need, but from a commercial perspective, there's absolutely no way you're going to make any money on that. So you, you, know, you just can't justify the cost and the expense to develop that drug if ultimately you're going to end up losing money. And then the, you have to have the right team pulled together to, to make that happen. So the first step uh, that I think everybody should do is what I call an opportunity assessment. And the purpose of this really is to make sure that you're making sound decisions up front and, because there's an opportunity cost to moving forward. And others have alluded to this and, and said it explicitly to some degree. Um, but your most pr uh, precious commodity is your time, right? Your career is only going to have so many years. And you want to make sure that the time spent is, is productive and that the results that you generate end up being, uh, you know, ultimately of benefit to somebody. And so I, you know, I would argue that the ultimate goal here is you have your baby, the question you want to be asking yourself is, how can I kill my baby? And, and I, because there's an opportunity cost here, right? If, there, if that project doesn't make sense for a variety of reasons, you want to abandon it early and move on to something else because you can't get back the time and it's better to kill something early and move on because it doesn't make sense rather than continuing to plow ahead and trying to plug essentially a square peg into a round hole. And so, um, you know, I I'm a, a physician by training. I understand the science enough. And, you know, as our previous speakers have said, really, there's, it's very difficult and there's lots of work and you really need to know technically uh, what, you know, lots of things to get the product even into the clinic. But I think we need to take a step back and really look at all the different aspects that impact it and do it early so you can make a decision, is this the right thing to do in terms of moving forward? So the, the, the eight key areas are you, got, you need to understand the disease, the epidemiology, what is the market attractiveness, what's the competitive landscape, because we're not operating in a vacuum. Um, you have to do a product-specific analysis, and I'll go into detail on each one of these, payer analysis, regulatory analysis, and finally financial analysis. If you do all these things up front, you can very, oftentimes very quickly figure out, even though you've got maybe a very interesting technical breakthrough, but you may have something that has absolutely zero commercial potential. And why would you want to continue to work on that technical question if ultimately your goal is to improve patient lives if there really isn't a strong case for moving that forward because somebody else has done it or there's other challenges that lay ahead of you. 
So first of all, disease overview. You really need to understand what's happening at the bedside. And as a clinician, it's been invaluable for me because I was trained to think that way. I know the right questions to ask. As an ER physician, I've worked really in every specialty. I know a little bit about everything. And I don't have to be an expert in cardiology or oncology or whatever, but I can go and ask the right questions. So I understand what's happening at the bedside. What is the current treatment paradigm? How are the docs looking at this? What are the problems that their patients are facing? What are the problems and frustrations that they're having? So others have said, go out and talk to the docs. Go out and talk to patients. Really understand the disease that you're, you're trying to go after. Because ultimately, that's where your drug is going to land, and it needs to fit into that treatment paradigm. And so the closer you can align yourself with that treatment paradigm, the higher chance you have of ultimately being successful. Then we need to look at the epidemiology. Importantly, how big is this market? How prevalent is it? How frequently does it occur? What are the survival rates? Um, my uh, current company, we're focused on uh, brain cancer. And we're going after glioblastoma because the five years or the uh, median survival for that disease is about 15 months. So in a very short period of time, we're going to get an answer of whether or not what we're doing is, is successful in the clinic. There's lower grade brain cancer, lower grade astrocytomas, the five-year survival rate is maybe 80%. If that's the kind of disease you're going after and you have to do a clinical trial, how long is that clinical trial going to be? It's going to be eight years, 10 years. Do you have the time and the money to spend on a, on a project that is, is that long? So you really need to understand what the survival rates are, um, what the volumes are, and segmentation. Are there sub, you know, are you going to try to treat the whole population? Are there specific segments of that population that it makes more sense uh, to target? Market attractiveness. Uh, how fast is this market growing? Certainly as, as we have an aging population, you know, there are diseases that are increasing more rapidly because uh, of the aging population. What's the competitive intensity look like? How many other different products are out there? Uh, you know, as, as was pointed out, for non-small cell lung cancer, if you think you have something innovative there, well, you're going into a really competitive space, right? It may be a really cool science, but is that really the battle that you want to fight, or do you want to go someplace where others haven't, aren't really uh, innovating at that time? And who are the, you know, understanding who are the leading companies and products in that space? Because what we are doing does not occur in a vacuum. We need to understand who, who our competitors are. The competitive landscape, I've found, my experience has been, this is probably one of the more important aspects of understanding what you're do, if what you're doing potentially has any value. Because if there's a problem, somebody else is looking at it. You are not the only genius in the room, and there are other, probably many other companies trying to address that problem. So what products are not only on the market, but what products are in the pipeline? And this is oftentimes data that's hard to come by, but if you have, you know, certainly at, at the universities here, you probably have access to a number of uh, uh, databases that, uh, that will give you, or you, where you can find this information. If you have access to a business school, see if you can get some of the students to dig into this. But I have to tell you that if you don't understand the, the current competitive landscape and the pipeline of what's in development, not only what's in clinical development, but what's in preclinical development, you may be absolutely setting yourself up for success, or for, fa I'm sorry, setting yourself up for failure because somebody else is probably doing something similar to what you're doing or doing exactly what you're doing, and just given the flood of, of development and innovation and information in today's world, you just might not have heard about it. So really take the time to understand what's going on from a competitive perspective, uh, and, and I think you'll uh, save yourself a lot of heartache, because if somebody else has already solved the problem that you're working on, you know, we don't, we don't need another 
antihypertensive drug, right? We don't need more, uh, you know, well, we need better diabetic drugs, but you, know, you need to look at the current solutions and say, ask yourself, how is this going to be differentiated? How is this going to be, uh, provide more value to the patients and the physicians than what's currently uh, being developed? So you've heard the, this target product profile uh, mentioned a couple times. This is really the roadmap for your drug development program. It's really saying, what does success look like at the beginning? Um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges uh, as technologists that we face is, is project creep, right? There's thousands of really interesting questions that we can ask ourselves, but what is the critical path to get from where we are today to a drug that's in the clinic and helping patients. And there's lots of biology questions we can ask along the way, and don't let that divert you. Well, the target product profile will help you keep yourself focused and help you figure out what success looks like. Because it, as it was previously mentioned, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough. And good enough is if you define that up front, you'll know when you hit it that, okay, it's time to move on. We've got good enough potency, we've got good enough safety signal, et cetera, so that you don't try to make, be perfect, because perfect is, is the sort of the, is, is a guarantee for failure if you try to just do, if you spend all your time doing that, because ultimately the patents are gonna run out and, and somebody else is gonna innovate ahead of you and they're gonna just pass you by. So urgency, as was pointed out also, as I tell my, my team, you have to be focused on moving quickly in terms of moving ahead. The timelines are very timelines of all of this are very long, right? But if we add a week here, add a week there, add a month there, you know, in and of itself, oh, it's only a week, oh, it's only a month. But you do that 20 times in a year, and suddenly you've got a, six months added to your project. And you do that every year, and suddenly over six years, you've just added two or three years to your project, and somebody else has beat you to the punch. So there has to be that clear sense of urgency, clear sense of vision of what your goal is, and driving towards that consistently so that you can get there before somebody else beats you to the punch. And that comes from developing a very robust target product, pro pro target product profile. You wanna to talk to the KOLs. Make sure that you talk to as many experts as you can so you understand how they're thinking about the disease and how they are treating patients so that you can then design the right product to fill, fulfill their needs and solve the problem that they, as they perceive it, not as you perceive it. It may seem a bit premature to be thinking about payer analysis early on, but ultimately it's important to understand how, is it, how do you think this drug is going to be priced? Who's gonna pay for it? Are they gonna be willing to pay for it? So if you're developing a drug for baldness, that's a lifestyle drug, right? You're not gonna get reimbursement. So you have to factor that into your model to understand, hey, we're not gonna be able to charge $100,000 a year. You know, I'd love to look like Bon Jovi, but you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna spend 100 grand a year for, for a drug like that. So even though it, se it seems like it's, eons away, under, you know, know that these kinds of decisions are moving earlier and earlier and earlier into the analysis process because they will have an impact. It's not enough nowadays to just come up with a great, great drug and think, oh, they're going to pay for it. No, it's a, it's a much more complex uh, scenario, and we really need to be thinking about this early on so, and bringing the payers into the conversation so we understand what their thinking is and what they would be willing to pay for. The regulatory piece is, is critical. Do you have a clear regulatory path? Now in oncology, it's pretty straightforward, right? Overall survival, progression-free survival. Um, but for a lot of indications, you know, what is the benefit that you're trying to create here? And is it measurable? Is it something that the agency 
is, is going to, to get behind. Um, my previous company, we took a bit of a risk. We were focusing on sleep disordered breathing, and we were trying to develop a drug to improve sleep disordered breathing. But a bad night's sleep is not a disease, right? So how do, you, how do we think about, imp you know, what are we imp ultimately improving? Are we reducing the risk of heart attack? Are we reducing the risk of industrial accidents? You know, ultimately you need to find, understand what the measurable endpoint is that's going to be the result of your therapeutic and make sure that there is a, uh, ideally, some precedent for that so that there's acceptance by the agency that the regulatory strategy that you're thinking about is one that is going to be acceptable. We live, you ha we live in a global economy nowadays and really need to be thinking globally about your drug development process, uh, process early on. How will the FDA think about this drug versus the EMEA in, in, in uh, Europe? How will the Japanese think about this? And, and some of the other territories. Because everybody is a little bit different. They have their own priorities. And so you really have to have a global perspective on this. And it'll impact which markets you go after. Maybe it makes more sense to just move into the European market versus the US market. Because the barrier here is much higher than it is in the European market. And then there's, you know, are you eligible for orphan drug designation? And the, a number of other programs that could potentially improve your probability of regulatory success. And then, importantly, what's the financial analysis? You really have to sit down, and this doesn't have to be um, a super difficult uh, sort of exercise, but you have to find someone on your team who can do a bottom-up analysis and really figure out how many patients are we, are we going to be treating? What kind of revenue do we anticipate? What's the cost of goods? And then what are the development costs? And really plan this all the way out to market launch and, and beyond, and then work backwards. And from that, we'll do, uh, we do risk-adjusted net present value. And that's where we figure in all those probabilities of failure into our equation. And so that money spent up front ends up uh, you know, being a little more expensive because the, the probability of success goes down as we move further and further along. But that's where we build value, right? Because we're taking away that risk. But ultimately, we want to understand, does what we are doing ultimately make business sense? Because once you get your drug into clinical development, and let's say you get some phase two proof of or proof of concept, it's the BD people and the marketing people that are going to be driving a lot of the decision making about whether or not to acquire that asset. The science is important, it's requisite, but ultimately, is there a viable business opportunity? Because that's what's going to move that product into, into the marketplace. So we take all that analysis and we pull it together into a commercialization plan that covers the broad industry context, what's going on in the marketplace, what's the intellectual property, um, you know, what's the IP space look like. You have to make sure that you have freedom to operate. One of my uh, company I started several years ago, really cool idea, we got into it, we're doing some really good science and start digging into the patents oh my God, there's another company that has patents that block us and they didn't want to have anything to do with us, they didn't want to partner with us, and we were dead in the water. And this is after I'd spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to move that project forward because I didn't take the time in the beginning to really think through what is the IP landscape for this technology. So we have to take all this stuff together and come up with a commercialization plan and ask ourselves, does this make sense? Does it make sense to move forward? If it does, I think the first thing you need to do is go to your tech transfer office, and before you publish a paper, give a lecture, anything, you need to do your invention disclosure. And I, 
I suspect that nowadays this is probably much better understood uh, in the academic community, but um, your, your insights, your discoveries are exciting. We want to get out and tell people about them, but an invention disclosure is very easy to do, doesn't cost anything, and it puts a stake in the ground and, and protects you uh, in case you know, somebody comes back and says, oh, was this actually disclosed publicly? Because once it's, it's disclosed, it's in the public arena, and it, you, can't, you can't patent it. So you have to, at, at a minimum, do an uh, invention disclosure, and then you need to talk to them, if you want to start the company, about what their attitude is about licensing technology out. Some institutions are much more um, supportive of that notion. They tend to back and load the deals. They'll tr really try to help you move, move deals out. I've uh, worked with institutions where uh, they've actually told me up front, we know 90% of this is gonna fail, so we're gonna milk it for everything we can up front. And they said that to me point blank. And the incentives were out of alignment. We didn't end up doing a deal, not surprisingly, because clearly they didn't understand that that's not how things succeed. But you need to know your tech transfer people. You need to work with them closely because if you can't get past that, then it, you know, it's, it's never going to get out of the lab. Fortunately, I think a lot of that's changed over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And, and uh, you know, I suspect here in Houston, uh, you've got a fairly progressive group of, of, of tech transfer people at your uh, various institutions. Spend the money on a good lawyer. They're very expensive, but they're no, nowhere near as expensive as a poorly designed licensing deal that at the end of the day will kill a deal. And so uh, you need to always be thinking about the, I've run over, haven't I? I have run over, I'm so sorry. Um, I get excited about this. Um, bad terms up front will kill a deal down the road. So make sure that you are thinking about the exit as you're getting into it. Um, and I, and the, the last two points I want to uh, emphasize, and this was said before, check your ego at the door. We're all super smart at something, but this is so complex and so difficult that it really does, as Hillary Clinton says, takes a village. And, and we have to work together and, and recognize that you're really good at discovery, and there's people who are really good at other things, and we all need to work together to make that happen. And talk to, consult, consult, consult means just talk to lots of different folks. And that, the cool thing is that this consortia provides those resources for you to go out and get those varying perspectives so that you can come into this with some open eyes and uh, find a way to kill that project early so you can move on to stuff that really is, is gonna make a difference at some point. Thank you. Oh.